talk about uh, fattening queer history and queering fat history to different and very exciting things um, from Carly Pendleton, who is currently studying for her PhD at Goldsmiths in, uh, in a similar topic. And this work is her developing on from her uh, master's thesis also from, um, from Goldsmiths. If you want to know more about uh, these topics and these thoughts, uh, she has a fantastic blog post and reading list with the Oxford Queer Studies Network. Um, and I really encourage you to look it up and if you enjoy this talk and want to know more. Um, otherwise, go follow her on Twitter as well, I would recommend. Um, without uh, any further ado or drama, I'd like you, I'd like to hand over to Carly. Hey, thank you, uh, Katrina. Um, let's see, as uh, Katrina said, my name is Carly. Uh, my pronouns are she, they. Um, and just before I start, I just want to thank the members of Queer Disrupt for hosting this talk and for working hard to make it happen, um, as well as to all of you for showing up um, and hearing uh, what I have to say. I hope you enjoy it. Uh, I hope everyone is safe and doing well or as well as you can uh, under the circumstances. Uh, just a quick note, I will be screen sharing a PowerPoint for the majority of this presentation. Um, there are so many wonderful like visual sources um, associated with uh, my talk and I just wanted you to be able to see them. Also, I just feel like it's easier for you to follow along versus me just like talking at you for an hour. Um, also, if there's anyone here with any visual impairments, um, alt text descriptions are available for each image, so you should be able to access those. Um, really looking forward to sharing my work with you. Um, let's get started. Okay, screen share. And everyone can see that. Is that good? Thumbs up. Okay. Yay. Okay. So on March 18th, 1989, the London Fat Women's Group held the first national fat women's conference in central London. Over the course of the day, around 170 people attended various workshops, roundtables, and discussions exploring how fat phobia manifested itself in British lives. Acknowledging the ways in which different identities intersected with and complicated fatness, such as sexuality, gender, race, and class, the goal of the conference was to identify and to combat systemic fat oppression in all of its forms. The conference attendees were hopeful that by identifying the ways in which systemic fat phobia manifested itself, challenging the narrative of fat as a personal failure, and crushing the oppressive structures that reinforce these ideas, fat phobia in Britain could be defeated. And yet the first National Fat Women's Conference was also the last. The London Fat Women's Group disbanded shortly after, and the rhetoric of the obesity epidemic has continued to dominate discourses around fat in the decades since. So this presentation will be divided into two complementary parts. Uh, part one will fat and queer history by examining the histories of the London Fat Women's Group and the National Fat Women's Conference, focusing primarily on the workshops held for fat lesbians and how these two identities interacted. Queer historical scholarship largely neglects fatness and body size as categories of analysis. By using a mixture of textual sources, material objects, and oral history, I will analyze the birth of fat liberation in the UK, the debates surrounding what it was like to be fat and a lesbian in 1980s Britain, the ways in which the London Fat Women's Group and the National Fat Women's Conference articulated fat oppression, and how fat and sexuality were viewed by the group and conference attendees. Uh, so three workshops were held specifically for lesbians at the National Fat Women's Conference, and I will argue that both the group and the conference marked a turning point in how fat lesbians and fat women were conceptualized, moving them from products of compulsive eating or patriarchal trauma to subjects of systemic oppression. I will also argue that the presence of contemporary anti-fatness is what has impeded any substantial historical inquiry into queer fat activism in Britain. So part two will then queer fat history by exploring the ways in which existing strands of queer theory can be useful in interpreting fat histories using the London Fat Women's Group and the National Fat Women's Conference as examples. I will argue that fat necessitates a queer analysis because of the ways in which it disrupts the norms surrounding health, sexuality, and gender. 
So while the histories of the London Fat Women's Group and the National Fat Women's Conference are entrenched in the identity politics characteristic of liberation movements in the 1970s and 1980s, I will also argue that certain articulations of their activism and oppression anticipated a queer or rather a proto-queer analysis. In doing so, I hope to elucidate the possibilities of fat history and queer scholarship, not as mutual exclusivities, but as partners in disturbing fixed identities. Okay, so part one, fattening queer history. So while US, while US based fat liberation movements had been around for nearly two decades, UK fat liberation was in its nascence in the mid 1980s. The London Fat Women's Group and the National Fat Women's Conference, hereafter referred to as the LFWG and NFWC respectively, marked the birth of an organized British movement to combat fat oppression. Fat lesbians in particular played a key role in the group and at the conference, articulating the ways in which they were doubly oppressed by their size and sexuality, causing them to occupy a marginalized position in both queer and straight communities. The LFWG and NFWC provided a space for fat lesbians and fat women to name and explore their interlocking oppressions by shifting the onus off of the individual and onto British society. As a result, the London Fat Women's Group established a framework within which fat could be analyzed not as a disease or a failure, but as a political identity. So influenced by American fat activism, as well as by efforts to articulate fat oppression within the lesbian community in Britain, the London Fat Women's Group burst onto the scene in 1987 with a multi-page spread in Spare Rib, the, UK, the UK's most popular women's liberation magazine. LFWG members also graced the cover of the issue above the heading, Fat Women Liberate Themselves, showcasing that fat liberation was and should be on the agenda of the, of the women's movement. So the September 1987 issue of Spare Rib introduced fat activism to a wide audience. The uh, article entitled Fat Liberation was written by Tina Jenkins and Heather Smith, who were core members of the LFWG. Offering an analysis of fat oppression that was specific to a contemporary British context, Jenkins and Smith declared that both their interests and the interests of the LFWG were not why people were fat, but why people are treated badly because they are fat. The article was divided into four subsections and it set out to do four things. Define fat oppression, highlight what feminists had written about it, show the gains that had been made thus far, and set out what could be done to challenge fat oppression. Jenkins and Smith defined fat oppression as, quote, the fear and hatred of fat, which leads to individual and institutional discrimination against fat people. They highlighted exclusion from employment, sports and leisure activities, public spaces, such as restaurants and cinemas, clothing choice, and the bullying of fat children as examples of how fat oppression manifested itself in everyday life. They identified contemporary Western culture and Western media's promotion of a, quote, increasingly thin ideal as the primary causes of women's dissatisfaction with their bodies. Now, the margins of the article itself were illustrated with adverts for diets, cosmetic surgery, and roly-poly grams, which showcased both fat phobia and anti-Black racism. Such representations, Jenkins and Smith argued, degraded fat people, stereotyping them as lazy, stupid, greedy, and asexual or sexually rampant. Limiting fat women's sexual possibilities to the incompatible positions of either asexuality or sexual desperation led to the internalization of fat oppression. Now this occurred whether one was lesbian or heterosexual to the detriment of all fat women's relationships. Jenkins and Smith fiercely excoriated the association of fat with ill health and the medicalization and pathologization of fat bodies through dieting and weight loss surgery, characterizing them as, quote, medical crimes. They argued that it was fat oppression rather than fat itself, which posed the true threat to health. Similar, uh, similarly, Jenkins and Smith criticized companies like Weight Watchers, which exploited the suffering of fat women for cultivating and profiting from an unhealthy relationship between food and women's bodies. Jenkins and Smith noted that while this persistent thin ideal negatively impacted all women, there was a critical difference between a thin person's dissatisfaction with their body and the daily harassment and discrimination experienced by fat people. 
In defining fat oppression, both Jenkins and Smith cautioned that given their own respective privileges and marginalizations, they could not represent all women's experiences of fat oppression. However, building a constructive fat politics was contingent upon viewing fat oppression as being linked to other oppressions, aiming to, quote, make parallels where possible. In doing so, both they and the LFWG anticipated the intersectionality that would characterize later liberation movements. Now, despite the multitude of examples put forth by Jenkins and Smith, feminist politics had largely neglected fat oppression up until this point. The few feminist writings that did critically engage with fatness were overwhelmingly pathologizing in tone and content. For example, feminist psychotherapist Susie Orbach's 1978 book, Fat is a Feminist Issue, was and still is the most popular text on fat feminism. However, Orbach argued that fat was the result of eating disorders such as compulsive eating, implying a certain level of choice and control. Compulsive eating, Orbach contended, was the result of patriarchal oppression, with fat acting as a protective layer against being sexually objectified by men, a, quote, buffer between our thin selves and a better world. Orbach therefore implied that fat was a sign of visible distress and that to truly be liberated meant to lose weight and become thin. Likewise, Jenkins and Smith also cited American feminist writer Kim Chernin's 1983 book, Woman Size, as attempting to articulate the tyranny of slenderness that was imposed upon women, but still, like Orbach, uh, associated fat with compulsive eating and a fear of being sexual. The only reprieve from these narratives was the book Shadow on a Tightrope, Writings by Women on Fat Oppression. Published in Iowa in 1983, Shadow is a collection of essays by American fat liberationists. The book chronicled sexuality, race, religion, and medical mistreatment against the backdrop of fat lived experiences. Revolutionary in its articulation of fat politics, Shadow for Jenkins and Smith represented a blueprint for how to approach fat liberation in the UK. They noted that while fat liberation in the US had been a political issue for 14 years, Britain was only just starting to consider it in 1987. This 14-year period of fat liberation in the U.S. had led to gains for fat women, such as appearances on radio and TV, articles in women's magazines, exercise classes, and clothing co-ops. Fat lib in Britain, however, had gone largely ignored by other liberation movements, with an Orbachian mentality rather than a fat liberation approach dominating feminist spaces. While there had been some criticism of Orbach's views in feminist journals, such as the magazine Trouble and Strife, Fat women who had tried to organize fat liberation groups had, quote, given up, burnt out by the derision with which they were met. Jenkins and Smith laid these failures squarely at the feet of thin people who had neither taken responsibility for the ways in which they oppressed fat people or begun to challenge their own and other hostile attitudes towards fat. Challenging fat oppression for Jenkins and Smith started with the political act of rejecting dieting and self-hatred and getting angry about your oppression. The London Fat Women's Group, therefore, collectively organized their activism around the repudiation of fat oppression and the creation of a support network for fat women. British fat liberation built upon the strategies of U.S. fat lib and adapted it to the needs of British women. Pressuring the NHS to do more research about the care of fat women, campaigning against diet companies like Weight Watchers, advocating for equal clothing options, and pushing back against familial and societal pressure to lose weight were all central to the aims of the LFWG. Furthermore, rejecting fat as deviant and thin as normal was and is crucial to a radical fat politics. Jenkins and Smith recognized parallels with, quote, heterosexism, which often put the onus on lesbians and gay men to justify their sexuality, while heterosexuality remained unquestioned. For example, lesbians and gay men experience similar pathologizations of their sexuality, which is viewed as a threat to society that could and should be cured. That was characterized in a similar way uh, as a deviance to be corrected. Uh, furthermore, cures necessitated a cause, hence sexuality and fatness sharing similar narratives of having origins and trauma. Fat women then should no longer feel obligated to justify their existence and explain their bodies akin to queer people and their sexualities. 
So while these parallels between sad oppression and heterosexism were the only explicit mentions of lesbianism within the fat lib issue of spare rib, the topic of fat oppression was already being strongly debated within some lesbian circles in Britain. The earliest known writings on fat oppression in the UK came from, a, from the Leeds Women's Liberation Newsletter from 1982. Two articles appeared in their April and July issues, both written by the same person known as Liz or Jazzy Kowalski. The first article entitled Fat Liberation, a Luxury, addressed the problem of thin dykes viewing fat dykes as asexual and not viable sexual partners while referencing fat liberation publications from the US. The second article, Fat Liberation, Some Facts, was cited by Jenkins and Smith in their article as being influenced by American fat liberationists and outlined contemporary stereotypes about fat people's eating habits, health, and hygiene, followed by evidence to refute them. So debates about fat liberation persisted in British lesbian communities throughout the 1980s. For example, Gossip, a journal of lesbian feminist ethics, was a British radical lesbian feminist journal published triannually from 1986 to 1988. In 1986, Gossip published two articles related to, uh, uh, sorry, related to fat, Amanda Heyman's Fat Oppression and Lynette Mitchell's Skinny Lizzie Strikes Back an Apologia for Thin Women's Liberation. Heyman, a self-identified white middle-class Jewish lesbian, articulated what she saw as the failure of lesbians to properly address fat oppression. Heyman argued that lesbians were reticent to take up the cause of fat oppression for fear that fat would, quote, rub off. This trepidation was unique to fat as there was no perceived danger of spontaneously becoming a woman of color or a Jewish woman. The dubious belief then that fat women could become thin if only they chose to do so led directly to the assumption that it must be laziness or some deep-seated psychological reason that prevented fat women from losing weight. Instead of challenging these misogynistic beauty ideals, Heyman argued that thin lesbians were internalizing them, inflicting, quote, fatophobia on their fat lesbian counterparts and rejecting them as sexual partners. Heyman contemplated whether it was thin lesbians, quote, fear of suffocation or fear of losing control over their own bodies, which led to fat lesbians being viewed as having no sexuality. Regardless of the reasons, the catalyst for change in Heyman's opinion was the banding together of oppressor and oppressed. Mitchell, on the other hand, argued that fat feminism actually reinforced patriarchal oppression by glorifying traditionally feminine attributes such as large breasts and buttocks. Mitchell's article rejected the idea that women were or are meant to be fat and that pro-fat attitudes harmed women by keeping them unhealthy and unfit to fight back against their male oppressors. Dieting and even anorexia, Mitchell argued, were therefore noble attempts to cast off body fat, which acted as a cultural sexual symbol of women's availability for exploitation and abuse. When it came to lesbians specifically, Mitchell drew parallels between the promotion of, quote, neo-femininity by fat feminists and the promotion of ultra-masculinism by the, quote, S&M cultists in the lesbian community. Both groups equally harmed radical lesbian feminism, she argued, by impeding the egalitarian society radical feminism aimed to achieve. This stark dichotomy shows how the ideal woman, in Mitchell's opinion, was one who appeared thin and androgynous defying both the feminine and masculine extremes. Despite relating how her mother had recently gained weight and was distressed by the lack of clothing that could fit her, Mitchell did not view lack of access to clothing as the problem. Instead, it was fat feminists telling her mother that she should be proud of her fat. Mitchell concluded her claims by declaring that she would, quote, not allow fat women to consider themselves more oppressed than her. Jenkins and Smith cited both Heyman's and Mitchell's articles in their Fat Liberation article. They referenced Heyman's piece as a British example of rejecting or balking in constructions of fatness and moving towards a fat liberation politics. Conversely, Jenkins and Smith charged Mitchell's article as being constructed with hate and ignorance and as evidence of the failure of thin women to properly tackle fat oppression. So the fat liberation issue of Spare Rib was met by readers with enthusiasm and celebration. Fat liberation at last, declared Val Lazenby, who worried that Spare Rib's engagement with Fat Lib was being permanently relegated to the odd letter. She related that only her lover believed that she was not a glutton and that a politically feminist, uh, feminist analysis of fat was long overdue. 
Similarly, Isolde Nally welcomed the magazine's platforming of fat liberation, sharing how her employment with the NHS was nearly jeopardized because a senior figure did not approve of hiring fat people. Nally concluded her letter by proudly proclaiming her existence as a fat, big, powerful woman who likes her body the way it is. While the readership of Spare Rib in 1987 did not represent the entirety of the British public, Jenkins and Smith had drawn on previous writings on fat oppression to set the terms of the debate in the UK. Introducing both themselves and the LFWG to the wide audience Spare Rib offered, Jenkins and Smith affirmed fat as a political identity and as a source of systemic oppression. This was a prelude of things to come for the London Fat Women's Group as further organization and growing membership excuse me, culminated in the first National Fat Women's Conference two years later. So 1989 was a pivotal year for both the London Fat Women's Group and Fat Liberation in the UK. In a matter of months, the LFWG made multiple media appearances and on March 18th of that year, they held the country's first National Fat Women's Conference. In addition to word of mouth promotion of the conference, the NFWC was first advertised in print in the August 1988 issue of Spare Rib. The advert solicited help for fundraising, publicity, and planning the nation's first conference to quote, challenge fat oppression. More adverts followed in subsequent issues of Spare Rib, each becoming more detailed in its objectives of the LFWG and the NFWC. Declaring their right to quote, live happy, healthy lives, whatever their size, the LFWG advertised themselves and the conference as a haven for all fat women who had suffered under diet culture. So the registration form sent out to conference attendees reiterated the aims of the conference to fight fat oppression. It outlined key issues for fat women, such as dieting, clothing, abuse, and stereotypes in the media. The drawings of fat women depicted both the daily struggles of fat women and the possibilities of what could be if fat oppression were to be conquered. The, the registration form also provided the details of the workshops to be held, as well as the schedule for the day. Options included discussions on fat women and race, fat women with disabilities and sexuality, as well as classes on self-defense, clothes and trouser making, and sports. Workshops only for lesbians and only for black and ethnic minority women were also available. The selection of workshops was therefore designed to both articulate the nuances of fat oppression along with other marginalized identities while also offering practical skills for women to utilize in their everyday lives. Now, in the months preceding the conference, members of the LFWG made several high profile media appearances, including on two primetime TV shows which exposed them to a wider general audience. The first TV appearance took place on February 14th, 1989, with the BBC Two open space documentary entitled Fat Women Here to Stay. Uh, members of the LFWG filmed and directed the half hour program, thus giving them the freedom to craft their own narrative. Highlighting the ways in which fat oppression manifested itself in the everyday lives of British women, the open space documentary focused on clothing, street harassment, employment discrimination, how diet culture exploited women, and how one could be fat and healthy. Now, as British fat activist Charlotte Cooper points out, the documentary upholds healthism in a way that would be seen as problematic today. For example, one member's multiple reassurances that she does, quote, not sit around all day eating cream buns, inadvertently plays into the trope that there are good kinds of fat people who cannot help their size and bad ones who could but choose not to. The respectability politics signaled here allude to both internalized fat phobia as well as classism within the LFWG, which was dominated by mostly white middle class women. The image the group portrayed to the public was, in a word, decent, making no mention of sexuality, despite some LFWG members featured in the documentary going on to facilitate the lesbian-only workshops at the conference. But nevertheless, for the first time, primetime audiences witnessed fat women refusing to feel shame about their bodies and reclaiming fat as a source of pride. The second TV appearance for the LFWG was on the evening chat show, Wogan. Uh, Heather Smith represented the group on this occasion. Um, LFWG member and NFWC facilitator Cherie Bell, who I interviewed, remembers the Wogan appearance as both amazing and odd as, quote, he was usually interviewing celebrities and then all of a sudden there was this dumpy little white woman on the show. <laughs> 
Uh, Bell recalls that debates over who should be representing the group to the media caused a bit of friction between group members. According to her, there were other people who felt they were more media savvy and would put the message across more efficiently than those who eventually became the more public face of the group. This friction with regards to the media foreshadowed what would eventually in part precipitate the demise of the group. So mainstream media reaction to the group's open space documentary was less than complimentary, with most reviewers accusing the LFWG of blaming the world for their unhappiness instead of themselves. Peter Freeman of the Sandwell Evening Mail, for example, alleged that despite, quote, bemoaning their lot, the LFWG did their cause little good, accusing them of verbally battering a nutritionist who worked for a weight loss company. Freeman further lamented that there was no message of hope for overweight women desperately seeking to let the thin woman out and declared that the fat women in this program deserved each other. Subsequently, Sue Allen, a reader of the Sandwell Evening Mail, took Freeman to task over his review, labeling it as predictable and further evidence of the cheap jobs fat women had to contend with on a daily basis. Whatever else they deserved, Allen concluded, it was not Peter Freeman. Despite the media coverage being tokenistic and temporary, Heather Smith argued that it was still a success as it allowed the group to reach a much wider audience than confinement to the feminist and alternative press would have allowed. This media attention was a sign of things to come with press attention of the group reaching its zenith on March 18, 1989, the day of the first National Fat Women's Conference in the UK. So in a matter of months, the London Fat Women's Group experienced a meteoric rise in public awareness a rise which culminated in the first National Fat Women's Conference. While the number of members of the LFWG had at, uh, had at any one time is unknown, between 150 and 170 women registered for and attended the conference, with many more turned away due to lack of space. The press created a febrile atmosphere on the day, attempting to sneak into the conference to take pictures of the attendees. Cherie Bell recalls photographers trying to climb through the toilet windows to take pictures of the women doing yoga, saying that they wanted to portray the event as a freak show. So despite the buzzing yet invasive presence of the press outside the venue, inside the excitement was palpable as the inaugural NSWC got underway. The workshops held for lesbians specifically are by far the most thoroughly documented due in part to core LFWG members such as Heather Smith facilitating them. Although several known written accounts of the conference exist, they all contain detailed recollections of the lesbian workshops, three of which were held over the course of the day. While not everyone in the LFWG identified as a lesbian, lesbian feminism and lesbian feminists in influenced the group heavily. As US fat activist Vivian Mayer argued, the companionship of other women offered fat women a social environment in which they could be loved for their intelligence and personalities rather than their physical attributes. However, the promise of lesbian communities as safe spaces for fat women often went unfulfilled. As many fat lesbians noted, thin lesbians were often complicit in reinscribing misogynistic, thin-centric standards on fat women, thereby pressing them. Lesbian Workshop 1 was facilitated by Kathy Hall and Heather Smith and focused on themes of image and sexuality while discussing experiences of being oppressed as fat lesbians. The preference for a sporty, boyish, dyke image by lesbians led to the valuing of lean, hard bodies over abundant, soft flesh. Furthermore, this reading of fat by the lesbian community often meant fat was equated with butch. In addition to the classism inherent in this link, this association of fat with butch was also caused by fat women physically occupying more space than was deemed acceptable. Taking up space was and is viewed as an essentially masculine trait with women expected to be smaller in both presence and stature than their male counterparts. Now this often leads to the pressure to apologize for one size by exhibiting heteronormative hyperfemininity in the form of makeup and long hair, for example. The myths surrounding fat lesbians therefore encompass not only their appearance, but the validity of their sexuality, as fat lesbians are often assumed to be failed heterosexuals. The stereotype of a fat woman turning to women because she cannot attract a man also led to the false belief that lesbian communities accommodate fat more easily than their straight equivalents. 
setting themselves, uh, oh, sorry, setting up fat lesbian groups was determined by the workshop as the best way to help fat women love themselves more, as well as protect them from public harassment and abuse. Lesbian Workshop 2 produced the Fat Dyke Statement, which was based on the U.S. Valley Fat Dyke's Womanifesto. Facilitated by Cherie Bell and Kathy Hall, approximately 30 lesbians attended the session in which statements beginning with the words don't assume were written to combat stereotypes about fat lesbians and fat women. The pigeonholing of fat lesbian sexuality as either one of desperation or one of asexuality was, was refuted, as was the limiting of fat lesbians to only butch diesel dykes or hypermaternal figures. The workshop highlighted the duty of thin lesbians and women to combat fat oppression as well. Lesbian Workshop 3 was facilitated by Heather Smith and used excerpts from Shadow on a Tightrope to explore issues around fat, desire, and sexuality. Thin lovers representing status for fat women and the acknowledgement of many, oh, sorry, by many fat women that they had never had fat partners showed how attendees had internalized fat phobia. The difference between the number of fat lesbians at the conference versus how few were, quote, on the scene, demonstrated the need for more fat lesbian visibility within lesbian spaces. Increasing their presence in social lesbian spaces, such as pubs and clubs, in order to, quote, make a big impression, as well as establishing networks with fat lesbians outside of London, were both key to solving this problem. The workshop also decided to establish a fat lesbian group and have a fat lesbian conference. So the NFWC concluded with a plenary session to summarize the day's events and to discuss what would happen going forward. Plans included a health group to lobby the NHS for a more holistic, weight neutral approach to care, an employment group to lobby employers and trade unions about fat discrimination, a fashion group to lobby the fashion industry about improving options for fat women, and fat, lesbian, black, and Jewish women's groups to examine how fat affects their lives. Attendees acknowledge the trickiness of advocating for the sexuality of fat women, given that equality and respect can be demanded, but desire cannot. Investigating racist, sexist, and fat phobic ideals of beauty and desire was judged necessary to disrupt and redefine who is and is not sexually attractive. The development of local groups across the country was seen as central to the establishment of a robust national fat women's movement. Now, tensions over self-definition of fat came to a head during this plenary session, with some women objecting to the presence of thin women at the conference, with Cherie Bell describing it as a, quote, bit of an argy-bargy over the issue. As Heather Smith noted, it is impossible to fix an exact definition of fat due to the many ways in which women's bodies vary. However, she argued it was crucial to establish the difference between a thin woman who believes she is fat and is dissatisfied with her body and a woman who is fat and experiences abuse and discrimination because of her size. Smith also stressed the diversity of fat women in their experiences, stating that, for example, fat black lesbians were at greater risk for street harassment, fat old women were more likely to be viewed as asexual, and very fat women experienced greater issues with access and exclusion. Cooperation between fat women and other marginalized groups, establishing links between activist communities, sorry, excuse me, and establishing links between activist communities were regarded as integral to moving both the LFWG and fat liberation in Britain forward. So why then was the first National Fat Women's Conference the last? A combination of factors within the LFWG caused its demise just months after the conference happened. It was burnout from organizing the conference and all the press attention, as well as personal disputes between members that contributed to the end of the group. For example, there had been no cooperation or help from other activist groups with planning the conference. According to Cherie Bell, it was, quote, such a mammoth thing to organize and was all funded by group members out of their own pockets. While some LFWG members and conference attendees used word of mouth to promote the NFWC, this did not translate into other groups organizing the logistics of the conference. The press coverage of the NFWC stretched across the UK as well as the Republic of Ireland and was as tokenistic as the reviews of the open space documentary had been. For example, the Dublin Evening Herald derisively declared that 150 overweight women squeezed into the conference where slimming was, quote, definitely not on the agenda. 
The Liverpool Echo contained the same lead as the Dublin article, although it discussed events of the conference slightly more in depth. For example, discrimination against fat women by employers, lack of clothing choices, and the size of seats on buses and in theaters was listed as some of the group's grievances. Uh, the article published in the Antrim Sunday Life was arguably the most insulting, stating that the combined weight of conference attendees was 28,000 pounds or 12 and a half tons. Each piece also mentioned the height and weight of LFWG member Ruth Tedern, describing her as five foot two and 16 stone, once again reducing fat people to the sum of their parts. So while there was no official ending to the LFWG, none of the plans for a national fat women's movement came to fruition. This is especially disheartening given the post-conference report, which almost eerily foreshadowed the group's decline. Uh, it stated, quote, setting up a national network is a huge task and it would be a tragedy if all that strength and pride that was generated by the conference dwindled to nothing. Well, this is not to say that there were no attempts to continue organized fat activism in Britain after the breakup of the LFWG. For example, the Manchester Fat Women's Group advertised their meetings in two issues of Spare Rib in 1989 and 1990. Describing their meetings as being for size 18 and over, the Manchester group solicited those who wanted to get involved in celebrating, campaigning, and discussing different issues around fatness. Uh, Vron reflected on her own experiences as a lesbian at the NFWC in late 1991, recalling how it felt like the alchemy of our fat women's energy collected and combined and strengthened us in, all in ways we are not used to. While there had hardly been a, quote, peep on fat oppression since the thunderous voices of the LFWG, Ron described her article as a way of trying to break that silence again. The debut issue of the UK magazine Free Size in 1998 described the conference as legendary, invoking the memory of the LFWG and the NFWC to promote itself as, as the legitimate forum for the new size acceptance movement in Britain. So while the legacy of the London Fat Women's Group and the National Fat Women's Conference endures, fat activism in the UK has never been as organized as in those few years in the 1980s. Political articulations of fat oppression have given way to a feel-good liberalism of loving one's body, turning the focus back onto the individual rather than oppressive societal structures. Queer histories of this period in Britain have in no way substantially engaged with fat liberation and its many connections to lesbian feminism, virtually erasing it from the historiography. In this light, it may seem easy to characterize both the group and the conference as failures, but as Cherie Bell sees it, fat liberation is just taking its time, saying that when put in the context of the decades and centuries long struggles of other marginalized groups, quote, I think we are on track. Okay. So part two, querying fat history. I know we're getting short on time, so I will try to get through this as quickly as possible. Um, let's see here. So the arguments put forth by the London Fat Women's Group and the National Fat Women's Conference to combat fat oppression were rooted squarely in the identity politics characteristic of liberation movements in the 1970s and 1980s. Fat scholars utilizing queer theory to interpret fatness tend to cast a sharp divide between fat liberation movements in the 1970s and 1980s and fat activism from the 1990s onward, the former being dominated by identity politics and the latter by queer disruption of dominant categories. While this distinction is useful in understanding the developments and changes in fat activism over time, it also limits the possibilities of queer approaches to fat histories that predate the establishment of queer theory. This part of the presentation will explore how a queer theoretical approach can be used to interpret the histories of the LSWG and the NFWC. So debates over who could and, could and, who, and who could not claim fat as an identity were ubiquitous within fat liberation circles in the US and the UK in the 1970s and 1980s. The wider societal perception of fat as, a, as mutable, separated body size from other categories, such as race, sexuality, and gender, to the extent that it was viewed as fixable. Similar to the sentiment that queer people could also be cured straight, thinness always beckoned for fat people. Unlike sexuality, which was often reduced to sexual acts, fat was not defined primarily by acts, but as a physical state and a volatile one at best. 
It is this volatility that separates body size from other categories like race insofar as fat is largely seen as within one's control where being black or white is not. While both sexuality and fatness are more complex than simple acts or physical attributes, heteronormative and fat phobic attitudes often dehumanize them as such. Fat activists therefore set limits on who could access fat safe spaces for women, for women to discuss their experiences of fat oppression and how to challenge it. However temporary fluctuations in weight may have been, they presented the possibility that one's claim to fat identity was ephemeral and at the mercy of group gatekeepers. In the plenary session of the NFWC, for example, struggles to define fat identity and who was entitled to access fat spaces was a flashpoint of conflict. Frustration by several conference attendees at the presence of thin women at the conference and the lack of permanent resolution to the issue by facilitators revealed the problem to be relatively unsolvable. While some attempted to delineate where general, where general bodily dissatisfaction ended and fat oppression began, creating a metric for who was actually fat proved unfeasible. These debates were reminiscent of US efforts to monitor inclusion and exclusion within fat activist spaces, which tried in some instances to mitigate the difficulties of defining fat in an objective and bodily sense by monitoring behavior instead. For example, some fat activists viewed fat women who took thin women as lovers with suspicion and questioned their loyalty to fat liberation. This suspicion was similar to 1970s radical feminists and political lesbians distrust of women who quote, replicated the power imbalances inherent in heterosexual relationships by, for example, engaging in penetrative acts with other women using fingers or dildos. The solace that fat women found in lesbian feminism stemmed from the passionate critique of the politics of appearance it offered, as well as the assertion that desire to a degree was choice. Fat women choosing each other as lovers was therefore a political act which doubly defied the presumptions that lesbians were failed heterosexuals and that fat people were failed thin people. The redefining of fat as a natural biological state rather than an aberrant pathology was another important aspect of fat identity politics. Refuting the medicalization of fat bodies was central to both the LFWG and NFWC's objectives advocating for more weight neutral medical research, as well as arguing that many fat women were perfectly healthy and ate the same amount, as thin people were common assertions by the group and the conference. However, by grounding their, their arguments for uh, liberation in fat women's proximity to normative notions of health and consumption, the LFWG unintentionally created a hierarchy of fatness based on the legitimacy of one's fat body and how healthy it was morally tinged identities of the quote good fatty and the bad fatty erased fat women with health issues and fat women who were still engaging with dieting. This biological determinism was also predicated on a lack of agency and reinscribed fat bodies as inferior and out of control. While the LFWG repurposed the term fat as a source of pride rather than shame, there was no real revelatory reclamation or redeployment of fat stereotypes distinctive of later explicitly queer fat activism in the UK. Uh, fat activists also utilized the coming out narrative as a way to challenge the negative connotations of fatness. While neither the group nor the conference explicitly used the term coming out, their efforts to encourage women to publicly reclaim and occupy a stigmatized identity, in this case fat, were evidence of this strategy. Furthermore, the connections of the LFWG to lesbian feminism made coming out an obvious approach for upending fat stigma. Uh, coming out as fat differed from coming out as gay or lesbian in that it was claiming an identity that was highly visible versus an identity which be concealed. Now this comparison is not intended to homogenize the many different expressions of queer sexualities, such as butch dykes or femme gay men that connote a more obvious aesthetic. Uh, it is useful, however, in that it illustrates the lack of choice fat people have to hide their fatness. The registration sheet for the NFWC offered a visual example of what coming out of fat entailed with its depictions of women throwing out scales and measuring tapes and moving their bodies joyfully. Uh, they were no longer choosing to pass on the way to thin, affirming their fatness as a non-negotiable aspect of self rather than as a temporary state to be remedied through weight loss. Shifting the narrative of the fat body from a problem to be fixed to a natural state of being was key to the LFWG's agenda.
So despite the constraints of fat identity politics, the LFWG and NFWC engaged with fatness in ways which can be described as proto-queer. Uh, here I use David Halpern's definition of queer to denote, quote, what is ever at odds with the normal, the legitimate, the dominant. Most often this definition signals queer sexualities which are at odds with heterosexuality. While questions of sexuality are central to questions of the body, queer theorist Eve Kosofsky Sedgwick argues that queer also works along dimensions that can't be subsumed under gender and sexuality at all. While drawing parallels between fat and queer sexualities is valuable, exploring the ways in which heteronormativity operates as a regulatory apparatus on the fat body reveals its queer potential. In the case of fat liberation, the LFWG and NFWC disrupted the heteronormative ideals surrounding health, gender, and sexuality in their efforts to fight fat oppression. The medicalization and pathologization of fatness and queerness are both products of hegemonic heteronormativity. Their objective is to discipline fat and queer people into morally and physically fit subjects who no longer pose a threat to the social order. Fat women in particular threaten heteronormativity by their unfitness to reproduce and are therefore desexualized by society as punishment. They are deemed too unhealthy to produce well children and too ugly to attract a fit male companion. Both fat and queer people have been and are at the center of moral panics and targeted by public health campaigns to eliminate them. So subverting the narrative of fat being synonymous with disease and refusing to diet in order to achieve such fitness illuminates the possibilities for fat to queer health. Despite the aforementioned healthism and erasure in which the LFWG engaged, the rejection of, of thin-centric health standards and their celebration of fat were refusals to be bound by heteronormative rules that base their worth and their ability to attract a man. These refusals culminated in the disco held the evening after the conference. Fat women who had been, quote, forced to exist on the social and sexual margins danced with confidence, celebrating and taking pleasure in their bodies. They did not move for the purpose of weight loss or for the male gaze, but instead broke through their confinement, rejoicing in their fat bodies just as they were. The spectacle of a group of, of fat women dancing together, transgressing heteronormative stereotypes of asexuality, and reveling in a sex-positive environment was queer. Smith described the women as, quote, sensuous, taking pleasure in their fat bodies and owning their sexuality. The dance deconstructed acceptable social and cultural notions about, fem about fat women's bodies by, quite literally, moving them center stage. Existing at the margins was both a figurative and a literal state of, of being for fat women at social events. One was either up against the wall trying to stay out of the spotlight or absent altogether as noted by lesbians at the NFWC. The unapologetic exhibition of a group of fat dykes within lesbian spaces and the intention of purposely taking up space, sorry, taking up room, anticipated many of the performative aspects of later explicitly queer fat activism. For example, performances of the, quote, obstinate fatty who embraces the negativity around anti-fat narratives like the obesity epidemic abound within queer fat activism. Instead of trying to debunk the myths that all fat people are unhealthy by proving their physical capabilities, they refuse to acknowledge such constructs as legitimate and delight in their impertinent refusal to be a good fatty. While the LFWG, excuse me, did not reject Indeed, they very much relied upon positive models of fatness. Their desire to disrupt fat phobic queer scenes with their bodies and their sexuality hints at the queer fat activism which succeeded them. Okay, I'm going to skip ahead to this last part. Um, so this refrain of failure appears multiple times across the records of the LFWG and the NFWC. Uh, the failure to be thin, failure to be heterosexual, and the failure to be feminine. But what about the failure to be remembered? The first NFWC was also the last. The LFWG disbanded shortly thereafter, and both remain relatively obscure within existing historiography. Thus is the history of the group and the conference one that is defined by failure. As gender studies and queer theory academic J. Jack Halverson argues, failure is a, quote, counterintuitive mode of knowing, falling outside of normative ways of being, and thus having potential to recreate and revision alternate ways of being. Instead of framing failure as a negative, 
Halverson cites it as a way of exploring what Foucault terms subjugated knowledges or ways of knowing that have been masked in functional coherences. These subjugated knowledges are not lost or forgotten, but have been deliberately disqualified, and Halberstam refers to this as knowledge from below. This paradigm is useful for analyzing the histories of the LFWG and NFWC. Given the persistence of modern day fat phobia and the erasure of fat agency from the vast majority of historiography, the exclusion of fat subjectivities makes sense. If fat people cannot be trusted with their own bodies, then they certainly cannot be trusted with their own histories. The pernicious limiting of fat existence to only disease, depravity, and death is therefore enforced by the eradication, not just of fat people, but of fat histories as well. Halberstam's definition of failure then becomes a valuable tool for resurrecting the histories of the LFWG and NFWC because it values the subversion of normativity. As English literature professor Elena Levy Navarro argues, it is this normative form of history, which she capitalizes as history, uh, which actively condemns non-normative histories to inconsequence. This capital H history, she argues, is used to debase the transgender, the lesbian, the queer, and the fat. The development of alternative histories is then necessary to resist capital H history. To do so requires a queer logic that eschews, quote, the linear nature of modern time that renders marginalized groups such as the queer and the fat as afterthoughts. This queering of time in the context of fat can be best understood as a resistance to what queer theorist Lee Edelman calls reproductive futurism. Reproductive futurism privileges heteronormativity by prioritizing the production of the future uh, through the figure of the child. Queer threatens this future, which is predicated on maintaining the heteronormative social order. Halberstam adds to this by arguing that those who live by queer time do not forsake, uh, do not forsake pleasure in the past or the present in favor of the future. For example, the assumptions surrounding fat bodies as failed thin bodies and lesbians as failed heterosexuals are made because both are seen as forsaking heteronormative modes of reproduction. Fat bodies are viewed as temporary befores that have no future until they embody thin-centric standards of health to make them desirable for reproduction. Lesbians are labeled as failed straight people because they refuse to reproduce according to heteronormative rules. Therefore, the visibility of both groups in society and in history is, uh, is obscured for the sake of upholding capital H history. And the narrative of fat bodies as temporary befores likewise serves to regulate fat bodies into heteronormative temporal arrangements. Uh, chrononormativity, or the process by which naked flesh is bound into socially meaningful embodiment through temporal regulation, and the extension of this process to entire populations, also known as chronobiopolitics, both organize humans' lifespans. By failing to keep up with normative tempos of straight life, such as marriage and childbearing, fat people can only be successful if they become or are actively working towards becoming thin. By failing to do so, they queer time. The liminal space that fat women occupy, liminal here meaning a limbo between health and disease, normal and abnormal, limits their agency and subjectivity. However, these, limit, these uh, limitations also open up possibilities for fat people to critique them. The discussions held at the NFWC by fat women on sexuality illustrate these concepts uh, by their focus on failure. Uh, describing how fat women's and fat dykes lives were viewed by, heteronorm by heteronormative society as out of sync with straight time. The failure to be heterosexual, sexual, and or in control of one's body indicated not only the limiting of one's romantic or sexual prospects, but also of the ability to fully participate in social rituals. Marriage for fat dykes was unattainable, both because of their sexuality and because they were considered too repulsive for, for romantic relationships. Likewise, they were excluded from having children because they failed, literally, to embody the control or thinness necessary to reproduce. Furthermore, the high failure rate of dieting long term meant that any reprieve via weight loss was temporary and unsustainable. The cyclical nature of weight loss and regain is baked into heteronormative temporal structures as long as they occur at the right time. So, for example, losing weight to increase marriage prospects and then, quote, letting oneself go after marriage. <laughs> 
So taken in conjunction with Navarro's applications of reproductive futurism to fat history, we can see how heteronormative temporal arrangements not only serve to regulate fat bodies in the present, but also to obscure fat histories to preserve these arrangements. The preservation of the straight social order depends upon fat people being circumscribed as threats to that order. Histories such as those of the LFWG and NFWC thus endanger this message by positioning fat as a locus of oppression rather than an aberrant pathology. In doing so, the failures of the group and the conference become possibilities, sites of resistance, and ways of knowing that defy heteronormative rules. Okay, and I had a conclusion, but for the sake of time, I'll just, I'll leave it there. Uh, so thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Carly. Uh, can I ask uh, everyone to just very briefly uh, unmute themselves and give a little clap for Carly, if that's possible. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So, okay, I've stopped the screen sharing. Thank you, everyone. And again, sorry about all the technical issues. <laughs>